Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Foster Church. We are so glad that you are here today. We're back to two aisles. Isn't that good? So we got the wedding. David and Anita all married this past Wednesday. So we just wish them a great blessing. God bless you guys. We're glad that you're here at Foster Church today. My name is Patrick Williams. I'm part of the pastoral staff. And we are so excited that you're here. If you're a guest here today, or if you're just coming in from one of the lobbies, welcome. We hope that you find your home here at Foster Church. And if you'd like to join Foster Church, just take out the communication card in the pew in front of you, fill that out, and give it back to Phil or myself at the end of worship today. Welcome to everyone viewing on live stream. We're going to begin this morning with a passage from Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Let's watch this together. John, wake up, all of you. Mm. Wake, come. What are we doing? We're praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Happy Sabbath, Foster. It's good to see you this morning. 
I uh, just want to say a quick prayer before we start. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we just uh, uh, counted a blessing to be able to leave the, the busyness of the week, uh, any distractions, uh, and uh, we just uh, also counted a blessing that uh, we uh, can worship you and uh, give you praises, uh, and uh, we do that now. Ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing.
powerful way today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. My name is Phil Rosberg. I'm on the pastoral staff here also along with Patrick and Courtney. And we are so glad each of you are here today. And we are glad those of you that are on uh, YouTube channel uh, live streaming this program that you are with us also. And I'm sure that David and Anita are with us this morning. So I just want to say good morning to them wherever they might be. Uh, the wedding was Wednesday. It was awesome. We had a great time here at the church. And if you have your uh, bulletin, if you turn to that back panel, that's where all the foster news is. The first thing is bad news and the rest is good news. There's no fellowship lunch today. It seems like the last time that I got up and did announcements, there was no fellowship lunch. So I'm going to quit doing announcements. We pretty much have fellowship lunch almost every, every Sabbath. But today we are not. We uh, need a few more lunch teams and we'll be able to do it even more often. And we appreciate all the work that all the lunch teams do do for us when we do have those wonderful meals. On the uh, chairs today, there's a flyer about Children's Praise and Bounce House, which is next Sabbath. So make sure if you're a parent of children or if you just want to come for an exciting time, be here when the kids help us lead praise. We have a children's story. They pick up an offering and we have fellowship lunch and a bounce house over in our uh, gymnasium afterwards. The high school and young adults are going to Dollywood tomorrow. Courtney, if she's in, Courtney, are you in here right now? Anyway, you guys. Thank you so much. And then there is going to be an open gym night next Saturday night, July 14th. And Matt Grant is the person to see for that if you'd like to come to that. Those, and there's other important announcements here, too. I'll have you see those. <clears throat> hey, Matt, just walked in. Open gym night is for anybody that wants to come, or is it within an age category? Older than 14, less than 100. Okay, thank you for that. I just snuck in on the back side of that. That's good. And I am so excited. We have prayer requests all the time. We've had people that have been ill. I'm so excited that Reese is back with us today. He's been in the hospital, saw him, and uh, we are excited for that. When uh, God answers prayer, we want to make sure we recognize that also. At this time, if you guys would all stand up, and ladies, and we're just going to say hello to people that are next to us, and we'll continue with worship and praise in just a moment. Seek your 
Sounds great. I want to teach you a new song this morning, okay? It's a, it's a song of, it's an island song, actually, from Hawaii. A worship leader that wrote it lives there. And uh, I need you to do two things, okay? The first one, I need you to clap, okay? Yes. But in rhythm. <laughs> and the second one is, uh, second thing you need to do is sing the chorus. Okay, if you can sing the chorus, I'll sing the verses. If, if you know the song, you're welcome to sing on the verses. But if you can sing on the verses, that'd be great. Okay, go ahead and stand. So that you'll have multiple uh, times to to go through this this course and, and it's really easy okay there you go goes like this
and it goes like this. Sing it out. 
Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you're here at Foster Church today. Today, we're going to be starting a month-long series on difficult passages in the Bible. And to start us off today, I thought we would show a, a video of what we're exactly talking about. This is a video of someone that you all know, and I just want to put it up on the screen, Gary, and just let folks see this. And then, what? Really? And then what happened? You wanted to go up the stairs? But then I barricaded And now you're mad at me? Oh, are you, will you forgive me? You're just frustrated. Okay, I'm sorry. Ava and Bissette Parabek, and, uh, and Ava is speaking in tongues, and Bissette is interpreting. <laughs> You're just frustrated, and then I barricaded the steps? What? <laughs> Today, we're going to be looking at a difficult passage of Scripture. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, it says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. It's a difficult passage for Seventh-day Adventists to grapple with sometimes. It's interpreted a lot of different kinds of ways. Some people believe that it's actually referring to glossolalia, which is an expression of ecstatic utterance. Today, we're going to kind of break this apart, and we're going to go through five steps to sort of see what the text is actually saying and to see whether or not it's speaking about ecstatic utterance or glossolalia. We're going to go through the meaning of the word tongue in scripture. We're going to look at several passages of that meaning of the word Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? The context of the New Testament, the context in Corinth, and then we're going to look at the passage and its application for us here at Foster. So we're going to start with the meaning of the word tongue. It says, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. That's a little hard to understand. For no one understands but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. This is further complicated because the King James Version puts it like this. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. In the King James Version, it adds this phrase, unknown tongue. And if you have a King James Version of the Bible, you will notice that the unknown part is in italics because it's not actually in the text. It's actually an additional word. The actual phrase is, he who speaks in a tongue. And that is actually the word glossé. Glossé. We're just going to define that for you. This is what the Greek word glossé means. It's the word from which we get the term glossary. Dictionary. It has to do with words. It's a language. It's, that's what the, the word should mean. A language, a tongue. We know this because in Revelation it uses phrases like this. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Nation, kindred, people. That's, that's people groups. Language is the term glossé. Every nation, kindred, tongue. Every language and people. It is never in Scripture, never an unknown tongue, especially by the person speaking it. Now, can you guys deal with the double negative here? It's never a language when the speaker does not know what he's saying. You get that? It's never a language when the speaker does not know what he is saying. The speaker always in Scripture, when he's speaking with a tongue or a language, understands exactly what he's trying to communicate. So this passage, Glossy, it actually says, for one who speaks in a tongue, that is, not understood by the listeners, does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands. So this is a person speaking in a tongue, and other people in the midst of it don't understand what this person is saying. But in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. The term tongue actually means language. That's our first step here. And then I want to define what it means to be Christian before we actually look at the text for several verses. What does the word Christian mean? We claim to be Christians here today. Christians are those who live and look and talk and speak and act like 
their Messiah, Christ. In Scripture, this is the first place that Christian is used. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They were so much like Christ that they actually attributed the name of Christ to this body of believers. They were called Christians. At one point in the book of Acts, there was a ruler who said to Paul, In a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. So a Christian is someone who follows after Christ. Paul put it like this in another passage. Be imitators of me just as I also am an imitator of Christ. This is what it means to be a Christian. So we're going to look at this. This is the Roman world. This is the Roman world during the time of Christ. This is 3rd century AD. It's a little bit farther along, but it's the same, same sense. And we're going to look at Judea, Judah, right down there. That's where Jesus was in the Middle East. This was the crossroads of the ancient world. What does it mean to be a Christian? That's where Jesus was in Judah, right there at the eastern Mediterranean. And all around him were these nations, Rome, Greece, Egypt, and the upper northwest portion of Egypt was called Cyrene. It's just the, the coastal territory of Libya. And then to the east of Judah is Babylon. These, all of these nations, crossed and intersected in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the crossroad of the ancient world. And all of these nations had their own separate languages. And all of them could be heard in the streets of Jerusalem during the days of Jesus Christ. Judah, Babylon, Egypt, Greece, Rome. They spoke these languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, Demotic Egyptian, Greek, and Latin. These languages had certain territories. They were defined by certain things. Hebrew was the language of liturgy. It's the language that the Jewish people worshipped in. They read their scriptures in Hebrew. But because of the Babylonian captivity, Aramaic became the language of their everyday life. They spoke Aramaic every day. When they came out of captivity to Babylon, Aramaic was the language they spoke. Egyptian, Demotic, was the language of learning because Alexandria was the center of learning in the ancient world. The largest library in the world was in Alexandria. Maureen and some of us from Chester are going to, to Israel and, and Jordan and Egypt next year. And we're actually going to go to Alexandria and we're going to see the site of the largest library in the ancient world. This was the center of learning in the ancient world. Greek was the language of literature. The Greeks had Hellenized the entire world that would later become Roman, that map that you just saw. And to correspond from one end of the, of the territory to the other, from one end of Rome to the other, everyone spoke and, and re, uh, wrote in Greek. It's what the New Testament is written in. And then Latin was the language of law. Because the Romans ruled the world, they spoke Latin even in Jerusalem. And when you were in Jerusalem, you could hear these five languages being spoken on the streets of Jerusalem. And we know that Jesus probably spoke all five of them. First of all, Hebrew. Mary turned to Jesus in the garden and at the, at the cruci at the, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and said to Jesus in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Remember when Jesus stooped and wrote in the sand in the temple precincts. And someone was looking over Jesus' shoulder, reading that out. He was probably writing in Hebrew. Jesus, as a good Jewish boy, learned Hebrew. We're certain, absolutely 100% certain because of the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus spoke Hebrew. But we also know that he spoke Aramaic because it was the language of their daily lives. Jesus said to the little girl that, had, that was dead, Talitha kum, or Talitha kumi in the King James, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. That's Aramaic. So Jesus spoke Aramaic, the language of Babylon, another Semitic language. When he said, Ephatha, be opened. When he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that's Aramaic. When Jesus went to the city of Samaria and spoke to the woman by the well near Sychar, he was speaking Aramaic. So we're certain that Jesus spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. Let's talk about Egyptian demotic. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take this child Jesus and his mother and flee to Egypt. The first years of Jesus' life were spent in Egypt where they spoke demotic. It's almost certain that Jesus came away from that experience as a child speaking demotic Egyptian. And would that make sense? Because later on, when he's bearing a cross to Calvary, they find a man of Cyrene named Simon to bear Jesus' cross because he looks a little bit darker skinned than they. It's very possible that Jesus even spoke Egyptian to the man who was carrying his cross. How about Greek? Remember the experience in the temple when there were certain Greeks who were going up to worship at the feast and they came to Philip because Philip had a Greek name? It was so prevalent for them to speak Greek that they named their children Greek names like Philip, which means horse lover. Horse lover. Phila, love, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and Hippos which means horse. And you know that word because you know the term hippopotamus means river horse. So they spoke Greek in this area for sure. And we know that Jesus went away to the region of the Decapolis, which was a Hellenized portion of the territory of Judea, of Palestine. And they spoke Greek in those 10 cities of Decapolis. So Jesus had ministry even there. And then finally, Latin. Remember, Jesus was taken in before Pilate, who was a Roman governor who spoke Latin in the court. Pilate said to Jesus, so you're a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I've been born. For this I've come into this world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? This makes so much more sense if you understand that Pilate said, quid es veritas. Because at that point, Jesus is silent. Pilate says, quidus veritas, what is truth? And then Jesus is silent and looks Pilate in the eye. And the Jewish people did this all the time. These word games, these subtle hidden meanings in in their statements. And Jesus stood quietly before Pilate. And all of a sudden... Pilate goes out and says, we need to release this guy. Pilate says, quidus veritas, and Jesus stands there, and all of a sudden, something dawns upon Pilate, and he goes out and tries to free Jesus. Something's happening there that is not evident, because quidus veritas can also be construed and misreconfigured to say, est we quidest. It's the man standing in front of you. What is truth? I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And Pilate realizes and goes out and tries to free Jesus. As a matter of fact, we know that when Pilate stood out in front of the crowd, he said, Ecce homo. Behold the man. We believe that Pilate actually wrote the the charge against Jesus on the cross. Jesus, the Nazarene, king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew and Latin and Greek because it was a cosmopolitan place. We believe that Jesus probably spoke all of these languages. Jesus is the only individual in the history of the world who had every spiritual gift. He had all of them. He could prophesy. He could serve. He could do miracles. He had gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues. And we see it in Jesus' life. The gift of tongues. We see him relating to Greeks and Latins and Hebrews and Babylonians and Egyptians. We see him associating with these languages across the cultures. But never once do we see Jesus speaking in a language that no one understood what he was saying. We are Christians. We do that 
which Jesus did. And if Jesus doesn't do it, then we don't do it. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to communicate in language like Jesus communicated. And he was one powerful communicator. Let's look at the context of the New Testament. In the book of Acts, the passage that we were read begins scripture, we actually have two words for language here. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking with other tongues. That's glossae again, glossae, so it's a different form. As the Spirit was giving them utterance. So they began to speak in different languages at the New Testament, in, at, at the day of Pentecost. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the crowd came together, they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. That is a different word. It's the word dialecto, from which we get the word dialect. It's a language of a specific region. Never an unknown language. Let me give you an example of that. Hi, y'all. How ya doing? Bless her heart. These are dialect-specific languages. These are dialect-specific phrases. To what country? What area of the United States? North Carolina, of course, because we all speak North Carolinian here. It's English, the glossé, but the dialect is southern. So when it says this, it says they were filled with, began to speak with other tongues because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And each person heard in his own dialect. It was so clear communication that everyone didn't just hear in glossé. They didn't just hear the language. They heard their specific dialect in that language. They heard as if it were tailored to them. Look at where it happened. They were amazed and astonished. Aren't these all speaking Galileans? I mean, shibboleth, sibboleth, right? They all, they speak. We can tell a Galilean just like you can tell a southerner. How is it that we each hear them in our own dialect specific to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia. Phrygia, that's where they get refrigerators. Pamphylia, Egypt. <laughs> Districts of Libya, it's around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking our own tongues, glosses, speaking the mighty deeds of God. This is what you have there. There's Judah at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And people from all of those territories labeled there, here in their dialect-specific tongue. And the communication of the good news is clear and concise and no one has any questions. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's the clearest communication that you could possibly ever seek for. That's the context of the New Testament. Now let's talk about the context of Corinth. The context of Corinth is this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. We're talking about a letter written to a specific place in a specific time, with a specific situation. So next week, when we look at the passage, let the women keep silent in the churches. Can you believe I'm tackling that next week? We're going to be seeing an address to a specific situation. We're going to see what that situation is, because guess where it comes from? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's the end of this chapter is an example of what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2. So we're writing to Corinth. And Corinth, you see Greece right there. That's the kind of the center of the Mediterranean world at that time. And this is a map of Greece. And the, this right here is the Gulf or the Bay of Corinth right there. And this is the Isthmus, the Corinthian Isthmus. Isthmus. Say that three times real fast. Sounds like I'm listening, doesn't it? the isthmus and right there is Corinth right there and today in that territory you have this the Corinthian canal they tried building the Corinthian canal in the first century AD that's all rock they tried chiseling it out to make a Corinthian canal 
between the Gulf of Corinth and the Aegean Sea. But they couldn't make it happen. They tried from time to time throughout the centuries until in 1881, they started this canal and they finally, with the use of dynamite, began to get it done. And they carved from the Gulf of Corinth all, way, all the way to the Aegean Sea, the Corinthian Canal. This is where it was. Right there on that little isthmus. Right there is the canal at Corinth. But at that day and time, they didn't have that waterway. So they would bring goods on ship down this little gulf right here, they would unload it at the Isthmus of Corinth, put it on carts, carry it across the Isthmus of Corinth, lower it back on a ship on this side, and take it eastward. That saved them so much time from going all the way around all these islands down here and then coming back. So they had this little route that they came through here, unloaded at Corinth, placed it on carts, took it down here, and then went eastward. So, because of that, this was a crossroad of the world. All the goods from the east to the west traveled through Corinth. If you were going by ship, you went through Corinth to ship your goods. So, in the city of Corinth, there were people from all over the world speaking various languages, different tongues. People from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then we come to this passage and its application for us. It starts out with this. Pursue love. You remember how 1 Corinthians 13 ends? It ends, now these three abide, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. When you're in the body of Christ, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is how you act toward one another. Love is not proud. Love is not puffed up. Love does not keep record of wrongs suffered. Love is gentle. Love is kind. Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but... Especially that you may prophesy. That you will be able to speak a word from God to a community that they clearly and succinctly understand. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially prophecy. For the one who speaks in a tongue or a foreign language does not speak to men, but to God. What does that mean? No one understands him. No one understands. This is a foreign language that the people there in Corinth don't completely understand. And the church in Corinth does not understand. But he spe in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. Why? Because he's the only one who knows what he's saying. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. Listen to what it says here. One who speaks in a tongue, a foreign language, edifies himself. Because the church does not understand what he's saying. He is speaking his foreign language. Nobody else understands it. But one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, foreign languages. Paul would say later on, I speak in tongues more than you all. I'm educated. I know all the languages of the Roman Empire. When I'm in Rome, I speak Latin. When I'm in Jerusalem, I speak Hebrew. When I'm in Egypt, I speak Egyptian demonic. I wish that you all spoke in tongues, foreign languages, to communicate the gospel throughout the world, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, foreign languages, unless he interprets what he's saying so that the church may receive edifying. No one speaking in tongues never doesn't know what they're saying. Triple negative. No one speaking in tongues never doesn't know. Does that even come out equal? Is that, is that right? 
unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. The gift of tongues is for the clear, concise communication of the good news of Christ. And if you're speaking in a tongue, an unknown tongue, a foreign language that no one can understand, then what good does it do to edifying the church? And then Paul uses a really interesting phrase. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or knowledge or prophecy of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, now he's getting to an example of speaking in a thought foreign language or a foreign tongue that no one understands versus speaking in a language that communicates clearly. Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? If you're playing a flute or a harp and you don't know how to play a flute or a harp, then how will anybody know what you're playing? They won't. For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for the battle? So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear. Is that clear? Unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you are speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world. And no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian. If I don't understand the language, the person speaking it thinks I'm a barbarian. And the one who's speaking it will be a barbarian to me. This is talking about language. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Let's just go back for a second. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. The clear, what is the gift of tongues for? It's for the clear communication of the gospel in the language people understand. And let's go back to the illustration of the flute, the harp, and the trumpet, the bugle. I'm going to play something. You guys didn't know that I could play the trumpet. I'm going to play something for you here today. And I want you to tell me what it is. You ready? It's been a while. It's been a while. What am I playing? No, no. What you need is someone who knows how to play the trumpet to come up and play it for me. So let's ask Daniel to come up and he will play what I was just trying to play. Daniel? Yeah, that was my excuse too, man. <laughs> this is what I was playing. I can't believe you didn't catch it. The illustration that Paul uses, if the bugle has an uncertain sound, 
then who will come to the battle? If the communication of the gospel is not clear, if it is in an unknown language that nobody understands, what good is it? It's like me playing the bugle, playing the trumpet here today. It's no good. And you all went away saying, was he playing trumpet volunteer? <laughs> when you hear, when you hear uh, Daniel playing it, you hear, I surrender all. And it's a clear communication. That's what the gift of tongues is for. So what is the application to foster church? I believe that there are a lot of times when churches communicate the gospel in a way that is impossible for other people to hear or understand. We communicate it in a way that's good for us, but not good for them. You know who we're talking to when we do that? We're talking to ourselves. It's like my playing the trumpet. But if we will communicate in the language that Asheville understands, whatever that is, then it will be like Daniel playing I Surrender All and not me. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we so hope that we can communicate the gospel in a clear way. We earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that we may prophesy. Each one of us in this room be given a gift of prophecy with a message about your character and your love for the city of Asheville. We seek it, Lord. We want the gift of prophecy. We want the baptism of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, when we communicate it, I pray that of all the churches in Asheville, that this church, Foster Church, will be the very best that it can be in communicating it in the language that the people of Asheville can hear and understand. Help us, Lord. Whatever that looks like, if it's a change of music or instrumentation, if it's an increase in drama, if it's more poetic, whatever we need to do, Lord, whatever we need to do to communicate the gospel, even if it's by telephone, Lord, make that happen for us, is my prayer for Jesus' sake. God bless you guys, and have a great Sabbath afternoon.